It is now time for member statements. I recognize the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the story of government support or lack of support for the autism community in Ontario has not been pretty. As far back as 2005, the autism community had been protesting the Liberal government. And although the Conservatives promised 1,000 per cent support for autism families, it has been two years and four months since the provincial election. There's really not much the Premier could brag about, and it gets worse. Last December, they repostponed the implementation of a new autism program until April 2021, which is perhaps the cruelest April Fool's joke of all. This month, I had a virtual town hall to discuss autism in Northern Ontario, and I was joined by three guest speakers. Sylvie Grenier is a bilingual board-certified assistant behaviour analyst, and she spoke about the unique needs of the North and the difficulty accessing services. Shannon Lavoie, her youngest child, Theo, was diagnosed with autism three years ago. She spoke about the difficulty accessing francophone services in Ontario, and Shannon Ketchabaugh spoke about her son, Todd. Todd is nine years old, he's nonverbal, and Shannon spoke about the cost to travel to access services for autism families and how it disadvantages them, both in terms of time and in finances. Speaker, the autism community in Sudbury and right across Ontario is relentless. They will never quit fighting for what is right and what is fair. And as Democrats, we will always be in their corner, fighting right alongside with them. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to thank the members of the Muskoka Watershed Advisory Group for their hard work over the past years and for the report they've delivered to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. I've spoken to a number of the members of the group, and I know they worked very hard on this report. I want, I want them to know I've read the report and will be talking to my colleagues about how we can implement the recommendations. Of course, after the flooding in 2019, a large part of the report was focused on watershed management and flood mitigation. I ask that the Minister of Natural Resources work with the Minister of Environment to implement some of these recommendations. There are too many recommendations to mention them all, but a few I found interesting were about reducing road salt in our lakes, studying and mapping shoreline erosion, judging the Muskoka River mouth, and researching the causes of algae blooms. And I also was pleased to see recommendations to expand the ASH program by Friends of Muskoka Watershed. This program uses ASH to address a calcium deficiency in the soil to help trees grow. The committee members are a mix of business people, scientists, and environmentally minded residents who brought a lot of different perspectives to the table. Again, I want to thank all the members of the group, Chair, Chair Marty Witzel, Vice Chair Don Smith, Patricia Arney, John Bocage, Julie Cayley, Chris Craig, John Miller, Kevin Trimble, and Dr. Norman Yan. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Today, I rise on behalf of frontline workers in long-term care home in London Fanshawe and across Ontario. In the midst of a, of a pandemic, they have been left to manage the impossible situation largely on their own. Time and time again, I hear from staff who have reached out to me exhausted and utterly drained at the soul-crushing pace of their workplaces. They tell me they tried, they're tired of not having their cries heard for help. They wish they could do more, but there isn't enough time or energy or resources. They've been betrayed by successive governments who chose to incrementally dismantle the long-term care system rather than build it to meet the growing and urgent need of Ontarians. By legislating a minimum of 4.1 hours of direct care per resident per day, my bill, Time to Care, is a practical, effective and immediate solution that would vastly improve the lives of those who work and live in long-term care. Even the government's Long-Term Care Commission interim report recommends the implementation of four hours of hands-on care. On Wednesday, Time to Care will be debated and voted in this legislature. The time for reading reports and commissioning studies is over. The time to come up with the strategy is over. The time to stall is over. Residents in long-term care homes are dying. The time for long-term care to pass my Bill 13 is here now. Will the government do that? Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. I truly believe that much of what makes Ontario a wonderful place to live and do business is the diversity and multicultural character of our province. 
people from all walk of life, background and cultures call Ontario home. That is why it is so important to commemorate and celebrate our diversity. Mr. Speaker, during the month of October, we recognize both Islamic and Hispanic Heritage Month to provide Ontarians of all backgrounds the opportunity to learn about their rich and vibrant communities. For generations, the Islamic and Latin American communities have made significant contribution to our social, economic, political, and cultural fabric. In my riding, Markham Thornhill, the Islamic Society of Markham and Denison Mosque have gone about and beyond to help the community during the COVID-19, including food and PPP donation and saving as a hub for community charitable work. This could also be said of the many Hispanic organizations across the GTA, such as Pua Rasha Latin Community Services, the leader in youth empowerment. Mr. Speaker, I hope everyone take this opportunity to celebrate Islamic and Hispanic heritage and recognize the important contribution they made in making Ontario the greater province that it is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Member Statements. The Member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. Today I'd like to update the House on uh, the circumstances facing Finn Sudwa from Timmins, Elijah Hennessy from Algoma Manitoulin, and Jeremy Atout in our riding. Those are three young children who have different circumstances, but they share one thing in common. They need formula to stay alive. It's the only thing that keeps them alive. And in Ontario, that formula isn't covered by OHIP. So we've spoken to the minister many times, a member of Algoma Manitoulin has brought this forward, the member of uh, Timmins James Bay, a member from Nickel Belt. We continually bring this forward, and I do it with special urgency today. We talked to Jeremy's mom this morning. So when their money runs out, Jeremy has to go back to the hospital, because in the hospital it is covered. He's a medically fragile case case chill child and if a decision is not made positively he's going back to the hospital where the formula is covered plus all the hospital costs he's got special emergency funding from ODSP for one week can you imagine wondering week to week if your medically fragile child is going to be able to be home the week after I urge the minister urge the minister to step in and actually fix this problem and allow these people to stay home where they should be with their families. Statements. Member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to commend the Orleans Bengals Football Club who have cared for our kids inside and outside the white lines uh, for many years. Uh, recently in Russell, Ontario, just outside of Orleans, a young black youth was bullied and attacked because of the colour of his skin. Uh, when organization president Qasem Khan and Chili Johnson, Vic and Charmaine Tadondo heard about the story, they leapt to action, meeting with family, providing free team fees and camps in order to show that this young man, uh, that he'll never be alone. Under the leadership of Tammy Kopp, the organization's principles to make football inclusive for all people are constantly on display. Tammy's leadership has created activities to drive inclusion on and off the football field for members of all gender identities and orientations. And the Bengals also believe that no child should be left behind, and that's why George Zagumas created the Eldej Belfi Bursary so kids of any income uh, can participate. In 2009, the efforts of the Orleans Bengals to stamp out bullying was recognized when the club won the prestigious Royal Auto Inspiration Award for its Be a Bengal, Not a Bully program. Mr. Speaker, these are but a few of the examples over the last decade where the Orleans Bengals have gone above and beyond the standard of simply fielding teams and decided to join the fight uh, against bullying, racism and prejudices. The Bengals have stepped up, and I want to thank everyone who dons the black and orange for volunteering to make our community a better place. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there is a very disturbing trend that calls for our attention and action. According to a recent online survey of 500 Chinese Canadians conducted by the Angus Reid Institute, 43% of Chinese Canadians and 44% out of them were born in Canada have been the targets of threats, insults, and intimidation during the pandemic. 
unfairly blamed and shamed for COVID-19. About 30% of the Chinese Canadian express. Thus, they often feel like others view them as the threat to their health and safety. They also report being victim of racist graffiti and offensive messages on social media platforms. As well, the survey revealed that 60% of Chinese Canadians fear access and change their daily habits to avoid unpleasant situations, and they worry that their children will be victims of bullying at school. Mr. Speaker, I call for action against all racism, building a true inclusive Canada. Although covertly acts of racism target individuals or the specific group, but the harmful impact on our society and culture hit us all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise and speak about this member statement regarding my community. This pandemic has been really tough on all of us, but in recent months it's been particularly tough for small business owners, especially in the hardest hit sectors like restaurant owners. One way I've been proud to show my support for the restaurant industry is by per participating in the Taste of Brampton. What is the Taste of Brampton? The Taste of Brampton is an annual culinary event hosted by the downtown Brampton BIA and local businesses. The Taste showcases the unique eats in Brampton through price-fixed menus and special offerings exclusively available from October 15th until the 29th. The Taste of Brampton will be focusing on takeout and outdoor dining on patios due to Peel Region having a 28-day indoor dining restriction. 20-plus participants will be involved in this Taste of Brampton. The businesses of Brampton welcome you to try their latest and greatest dishes during the Taste. Now, some of the participating restaurants are Me Churros in downtown Brampton. They have the following promotions, three churros for coffee for $4 and 10 baby churros with coffee for $4.50. So I know we're all getting hungry just listening to it. Now, together, Mr. Speaker, we can all make a huge difference. As part of our NDP Save Main Street plan, there must be a goal of keeping restaurant jobs afloat by limiting food delivery fees. Our restaurants need support, real support, not photo ops of MPPs taking order out. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to say a few words about what our government is doing despite the pandemic. Yes, government does continue in 2020, looking clearly forward to the future of the province and the needs of its people. Today, I want to speak specifically about hospitals, schools, and long-term care. In each of these important areas, our investments continue despite the pandemic. Our commitment to thousands of new long-term care beds began with construction and reconstruction efforts back in 2018 and has continued province-wide after neglect that sadly had lasted for more than a decade. New hospital announcements continue such as the one last Friday in Picton, a wonderful town that I was privileged to represent as a federal member for almost 12 years. This new hospital is certainly needed, and our government is proceeding with it, thanks to all the people who worked so hard to get that. And in my riding of Hating, Lennox and Addington, we recently cut the ribbon on a replacement bridge over the Scudamata River, north of Tweed, and last week announced a brand new primary school with childcare for Amherstview, a growing community in the eastern part of our province. So, Mr. Speaker, this is real infrastructure. This is not just talking about something and not doing. This is actually doing, doing things. This is not pie in the sky infrastructure or money wasting turbines that ruin our vista, they harm our residents, and they cost everybody more money on their electricity bills. The Green Energy Act was a disaster. Our infrastructure program is delivering results. It's about getting Ontario out of the ditch and back on track. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last week, from October 19th to 23rd, was National School Bus Safety Week. Every day, 800,000 students across the province rely on school buses to get them to and from the classroom. In Waterloo Region, almost 30,000 students take a school vehicle, including my son, who uses the bus to get to his middle school every day. Nothing is more important than our children, and I, along with my government colleagues, the Minister of Transportation and the Minister of Education, are committed to enhancing school bus safety. 
Within our first year as government, we made regu regulatory changes that allowed, allowed stop arm camera technology to be used as evidence to hold drivers accountable. But did you know, Speaker, that Ontario is the only province in Canada that doesn't use a dual lamp amber and red light warning system? This system would make our buses even safer, Mr. Speaker. At a traffic light, drivers already know to stop when it's red and to be cautious when it's amber. And this would be the same approach they would use with a school bus. School bus drivers would flash the amber lights to give drivers clear advance notice that they will soon be stopping. And the red lights would come on when this bus is stopped and children are getting on and off. A Transport Canada study found that the amber and red system reduced the speed of oncoming vehicles and prevented more drivers from passing a stopped school bus. I wholeheartedly support this, and I am looking forward to introducing a private member's bill to make this change, Mr. Speaker. Anything we can do to keep our children safer is worth doing, and I hope my colleagues will support it. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements. I've been advised that the Minister of Health may have a point of order. Speaker, point of order. I would like to call to the attention of all members that this week is Respiratory Therapy Week, and I ask this House to join me in recognizing all the hard work that respiratory therapists are doing across the province to help our patients, especially now during COVID. So thank you very much, all respiratory therapists, for your tireless work.